grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, your beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ said, whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts inasmuch as you came to us in your Son's word and caused us to hear the same that we might also keep your word, that we might depend upon it with our whole heart, and in the midst of death, take comfort in it. For the sake of your dear Son, our Savior. Amen. The previous pastor that I worked with, he was prone to say that Jesus is God with dirty fingernails. Moreover, Jesus was just an average looking Jew. I know that in so many of our depictions, I, I call him the Vidal Sassoon Jesus. He's always got pretty skin and beautiful flowing hair. But Isaiah 53 2 says of Jesus, he had no form or majesty that we should look upon him and no beauty that we should desire him. All this means is, is Jesus was common looking, run of the mill. But, on the other hand, there was clearly something about him, something that, get this, drew children to him like moths to a flame. Think of that. I mean, even me, I go up to children and they're like, oh! Stay over there. Don't come any closer. Jesus, with him, they would just run to him. So much so that the disciples did what? Get off of him. Get off of him. And Jesus said what? No. Let him come. Let him come. There was something about Jesus that made sinners tell him to flee their presence. And there was something about Jesus that made religious leaders and those who trusted in themselves and who would not listen to him seethe with anger. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. You know, two weeks ago we heard the Pharisees claim Jesus did his miracles by the power of the devil. Today we hear unbelieving Jews claim Jesus' doctrine Doctrine is just a word for teachings. His teachings, well, they're from the devil as well. You know, ever since a Messiah was promised back in the Garden of Eden, the devil's intent has been to either prevent the seed of a woman being born or destroying him after he is born. And from our text today, Jesus says of the devil that he was a murderer from the beginning. So, let's go back to the beginning. Who inspired Cain to kill his brother Abel? 1 John 3 verse 12 says, the devil did. But Abel did not carry the seed of the Messiah. Seth would carry the seed of the Messiah, that being Adam and Eve's third born son. Well, then the Bible follows this righteous line of Seth all the way to Genesis 6, where we see how the devil calls the entire human race to become corrupt except one man and his family, Noah. Eight souls in all, which is why that baptismal font has eight sides. Noah's line through his son Shem is followed right up to the building of the Tower of Babel where again the human race is corrupted. And this time it's through a political religious system of which God thwarts by confusing their language which causes them to scatter. The narrative then slows considerably focusing on Abraham, Isaac, and his son Jacob. You remember how Esau wanted to kill Jacob? Why? Because Jacob carried the Messiah in his loins. Who was behind that murderous rage? The devil was. 
Years later, who do you think inspired Pharaoh to have all the little baby boys thrown into the Nile River? Well, that was the devil too. Yet God raised up Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And as they traveled, who do, you, who do you think inspired King Balak of Moab to get a guy by the name of Balaam to curse the Israelites? You got it. It was the devil. Think of the number of times that David, who carried the Messiah in his loins, escaped death, even from the hands of King Saul, who was possessed by evil spirits. Who was behind those murderous attempts? Clearly, the devil was. And at one point in Israel's history, the devil was successful in killing all the royal house of the tribe of Judah. Joash, who was the only person on earth through whom the Messiah could come, he hid in the temple for six years, waiting for the threat to dissipate. After it did, during the time of Esther, a man by the name of Haman issued a decree to kill all Jews, young and old, including women and children, all in one day. Who came up with that diabolical plan? The devil. Yet God used Esther and Mordecai to spare the nation. Folks, this is just a small sampling of how the devil repeatedly tried to cut that scarlet thread to destroy this bloodline that runs from Adam all the way to Christ. I mean, who inspired Herod to kill all the little baby boys born in Bethlehem? Who inspired these Jews whom Jesus is talking to to pick up stones and attempt to kill our Lord when He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, that before Abraham was, I am. Jesus there is using the same two words that God used to reveal Himself to Moses at the burning bush. It was a clear proclamation of His deity. These Jews should have taken off their shoes. They should have fallen on their faces in worship. But no. <laughs> they start looking around for stones to start hurling at Jesus. Who again, beloved, who do you think inspired this murderous intent? The devil. Which is why Jesus tells them, your will is to do your Father's desires. Your will, that is to eliminate me, is exactly what the devil wants you to do, for you belong to him. The devil is your father. <sighs> My goodness! You see why we like that Vidal Sassoon, soft and cuddly Jesus? The Jesus that's got teeth that bites Beloved, this is why this gospel lesson is the last one in Lent. Religious leaders at this point, they are hell-bent on the destruction of Jesus. Yet one of the beautiful things about this average-looking man standing before them filled with holiness, love, and with truth is they cannot take his life, nor can the devil. Let me bake your noodle for just a second. Who do you think caused that storm to come upon Jesus and the disciples when they were in the boat? And these seasoned fishermen are fearful for their life. You say, the devil has control of weather? Anybody read Job lately? Where the devil causes winds to blow upon the house of Job, killing all of his family, with the exception of his wife? I know it's hard to put the devil on the flannel graph, isn't it, when we learned that in Sunday school? <coughs> Folks, he's there. And no one can take his life. That's why he gets up out of that boat and he says, Be still wind and wave immediately die out. No one 
takes his life for Jesus willingly lays it down when he's ready. But the devil isn't just a murderer. He's a liar. He is the father of lies. Jesus calls him, which started back at the beginning too, when the devil uttered rather those false words that begin with the question, did God really say? And this convinced our first parents that God wasn't good, that he was holding back, so to speak, on Adam and Eve. And this persuaded them not to listen to God, not to trust in him. And believing the venom of this lie, they were turned in upon themselves and completely away from God. Which, as you know, has had a tremendous effect upon you. Do you remember those crack babies of the 80s? Those children that were exposed to crack cocaine while they were in utero? Well, you were born with something much worse. You were born a venom baby. Born with the venom of the serpent of Eden coursing through your veins. You were born a sinner, steeped in death, and yet praise be to God, You've been baptized for life. And as a result of that, what, do, what God, what does our Lord promise to you, O baptized saint? Sure, death is the wages of sin and all of sin, but Jesus, this average looking man with these dirty fingernails, he says to you, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see, he will never taste death. Believing Jesus' words are the antidote to death. They are the anti-venom. Meaning that death is no longer a threat to you. You know, strangely in the church, death becomes a friend. Because death takes you across a threshold to a new and eternal life that only Jesus can give. Now, folks, all of this was foolishness. All of this was utter nonsense. For clearly, that is to the Jews, for clearly everyone sees death. Abraham, Moses, David. I mean, folks, you can go to Israel today and go see David's tomb. They might charge you $5, but you can go see it. Sure enough, you walk around a corner. David's tomb, boom, right there. None of those prophets conquer death. They hear Jesus' words and dishonor Him by their unbelief, mocking Him. All the while they dig their heels into the devil's kingdom. And this is what gets me so worked up. How many people today still believe the exact same Jewish mockery? Where they have rejected the truth of Jesus and his words, and they are swallowed up in a sea of lies. However, you, you who keep Jesus' words, you who repent of your sins, you who believe in Jesus' promises to free you, to feed you, to give you life, you will never taste death. Because Jesus, your Jesus, He's tasted it for you. Yes, your body will stop working and it'll sleep in the earth for a time, but your soul will not be buried in the earth with your body. Your soul will not suffer the wrath of God or the torment of hell. Your soul will be carried by the angels to Abraham's side in the presence of God where you will wait the day of resurrection. And Jesus, who took on flesh to be that promised lamb, that once for all sacrifice, died in your place so that you would be spared. This is such an incredible promise. And it is a promise that has the power of the Holy Spirit behind it to bring people to believe it. Well, if Jesus' words hadn't riled up the unbelieving Jews enough before, this final claim that he makes, it does the trick. Jesus tells them, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. 
the unbeliever said, you're not 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Again, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am the one who was in the beginning before time began. I am the one who promised Adam and Eve a seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. I am the one who appeared to Abraham and promised him a seed who would be a blessing to all the nations. Abraham, Jesus says, he's my man. Whom I say. And as a result, Abraham sees life. Abraham is fully sanctified. Abraham is at one with the will of the Father. The devil tells lies. Jesus tells the truth. And these unbelieving Jews, they can't stand it any longer. They can't bear it nor can the unbelieving world today. A praise be to God you have. You have believed it. And it's not even a work of yourself. The Holy Spirit brought you to that understanding. And so I say in conclusion, beloved, it doesn't get any more serious than this. If one does not believe the truths of Jesus, they're lost. If one claims to believe in God, but they don't rely upon Jesus' words, then they're liars. But if you believe, you have God's forgiveness, and you have eternal life, and you will never taste death. Just like Abraham of old, who, was, who saw Jesus' day and was glad, you too will see the day of His final coming. And on that day, Oh, how glad you will be. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for the offertory.